just on my mind, uh, maybe take a little. Turn with me to Genesis chapter 1 this evening. Hallelujah. I was thinking on the subject and considered that, you know, on your wedding day, you sure don't remember anything. I'll share some things on, on Saturday. I'll share some things with the, the couple that's to be married about, you know, how uh, marriage is God's plan and how wonderful it is. I'll share a little bit about the roles and responsibilities. They won't remember any of it. <laughs> so I thought maybe in advance of, thankfully, <clears throat> these two lives that will be joined before the Lord and before this body on on Saturday, have heard these truths, have been brought up under these truths. Count Jesus as the Lord of their lives and his word authoritative, amen? The truths that we cover this evening, obviously, are not just for the couple that is to be married on <clears throat> Saturday. Uh, they apply to, certainly to all those here that are married and uh, according to the Ephesians 5 passage, these truths that we talk of pertain to Christ and the church, don't they? We should all consider ourselves as part of the bride of Christ. It should be very much our prayer, come Lord Jesus. Wait in the, that day when he will come in the clouds. There will be a, a shout, the voice of an archangel, the trump of God will be changed in, the moment, in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. And one of the things that wait, awaits us is the marriage supper of the Lamb. We're the bride, he's the bridegroom. We will be joined unto the Lord forever and ever. Isn't that glorious to look forward to? What it will be like, I do not know, but it will be good. And we look forward to that. We wanted to talk some this evening, yes, about the, the, on the subject of marriage, marriage God's way. And <clears throat> rightly, we would start here in Genesis chapter 1. Look with me down to verse 26. And God said, let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. And God blessed them, and said unto them, be fruitful, and multiply, replenish the earth, and subdue it. And have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. And we find here that, yes, indeed, man has been made in the image and after the likeness of God. Amen? Made the male and female. We would read on into chapter 2, which, as of course you've read, uh, you find that in chapter 1, in the verses that we just read, there is the, the summary description of God having created man, male and female. But then in chapter 2, we get a little bit more detailed description of what took place in that creation, don't we? And we'd find, we're just going to jump in at verse 15, and the Lord took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to dress and to keep it. And the Lord commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden that th thou mayest eat freely, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. And verse 18, the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make an help meet for him. So we read in chapter 1 that God made them man, male and female created them, and now we find chapter 2, uh, Adam's alone. So this is just a, a description of how the uh, created, creative process took place, how woman came into being. Out of the ground the Lord formed every beast of the field, fowl of the air, brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them, and whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. Adam gave names to all the cattle and the fowl of the air and to the, every beast of the field, but for Adam there was not found in help Meet for him. And the Lord caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept, and he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh thereof, and the rib which the Lord had taken from man made he a woman and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and mother and shall cleave unto his wife. And they shall be one flesh. 
They were both naked, and the man and his wife, and they were not ashamed. So we see here that, yes, as we know, woman was taken out of man. Originally, there's just man. There's just Adam. And God says it's not good that man should be alone. Interesting, <clears throat> the, the, the sequence, because in the other living things that God created, he, he created uh, <clears throat> male and female among all kinds of living things, didn't he? But man originally was just, just man, and then subsequently he made woman. And he says it's not good for man to be alone. I will make an help meet for him. Not good to be alone. Uh, and any husband knows that. Not good. God's original plan, his plan from the beginning, that it was that there would be husbands and wives, that they would marry, and that they would be joined together. <clears throat> Verse 24 again, a man leaves father and mother and cleaves unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. They, in God's plan, they come together and they become one, united before the Lord in relationship with one another. I brought along, and we move from this Genesis passage rather quickly, but I brought along here verses 8 and 9 of 1 Corinthians 11. 1 Corinthians 11, where the scripture says, For man is, for man is not from woman, but woman from man. Nor is man created for the woman, but the woman for the man. And we, we may return to the, the passage in Genesis 1 as we go on, as it talks of the help, which is meet or suited to the man. That's God's plan, and that's the, that's the way in Christian marriages, the individuals view their roles. They're therefore, a wife is there for her husband. A husband loves the wife. Of course, they love each other. But the instruction is given there um, several times in Ephesians. Husbands love the wives. Wives in, in submission and subjection to their husbands. And the wife's role is one of a, a help, well suited to her husband. <clears throat> we're we're going to touch on a number of different <clears throat> aspects of the relationship. But... Over in Proverbs chapter 18, verse 22, the scripture reads, Whoso findeth a wife findeth a good thing and obtaineth favor of the Lord. This is always the way a man should view his wife. In a, in a Christian relationship, there is the value placed on individuals that God places on them. Amen? And the husband considers that <clears throat> that he has been blessed of the Lord, having been given a good godly wife. It's always a, a blessing to me. I, I, not infrequently, in conversation with some of the men in the fellowship, hear them refer to the rich and wonderful blessing that their wife is to them. How thankful they are, how undeserving they are of the good and godly wife. You know, some of them will speak of just, well, I feel like my wife was the one that really rescued me from the mess that I was in, or she was really used of the Lord to, you know, to get me on my feet and point it in the right direction, or she's such a strength and in in a stabilizing influence in my life, and that's the way it's supposed to be. Whoso finds a wife finds a good thing and obtains favor of the Lord. Favor of the Lord. Not just, you know, uh, uh, well, I, I mean, I got this trophy wife or, uh, boy, she sure can cook or... No, when it's a marriage in the, according to the order and plan of God, then the wife is a, is a gift from God through whom God favors or blesses the man. And the man should always, the husband should always view his wife as that, as that, as, as being a blessing to him from the Lord, obtaining favor of the Lord. Because God says it's, again, not good to be alone. Not good for that man to be alone. And in, a, in finding a good godly wife, he obtains favor or help, blessing from the Lord. Psalm, excuse me, Proverbs 19, verse 14 House and riches are the inheritance of fathers. A prudent wife is from the Lord. 
this passage speaks of the kinds of things that uh, in, in a natural relationship a, a father might look to provide leave for his son an inheritance but a good godly wife that comes from God a prudent wife is from the Lord and then also Proverbs 31 while we're here in this book from verse 10 who can find a virtuous woman her price is far above rubies the heart of her husband doth safely trust in her so that he shall have no need of spoil she will do him good and not evil all the days of her life well we speak of this as being the perspective certainly that the husband should take but a wife should also view her her role as as one where she's to be this to her husband doing him good and not evil all the days of his life amen a virtuous woman her husband should prize her far above rubies and he safely trusts in her well she considers her role as one uh, of doing him good and not evil always all the days of his life that's what she's called of God to do we we think of the husband-wife relationship and we think of the the role and responsibility that we have to the spouse but never can we forget that it is as unto the Lord it's unfortunate but over the years I've had occasion uh, <clears throat> too many times to talk with married couples that for one reason or another were were struggling in their in their relationship and it's as though they uh, had forgotten that they first and foremost have a responsibility to be a godly spouse as they stand before God Almighty you know sometimes a relationships deteriorate into you know the <clears throat> well I guess we could be real blunt the proverbial peeing contest right or conflict where you know they did me bad so I'm just going to do them bad how sad that is the individuals in a relationship are to love and honor God fulfilling their God called God ordained role regardless of what the other one is doing amen amen and you know when things are working the way they should be working if there is one member of the of the party that isn't doing as they should then the the love and care that is shown by the other will be used of the Lord to win them and bring them around will be used of the Lord to convict them of their carnality their selfishness their stubbornness so when we read who can find a virtuous woman is her price is far above rubies the heart of her husband doth safely trust in her so that they'll have no need is spoiled yep we think of the the value that a husband rightly places upon a good godly wife she'll do him good and not evil all the days of her life she is mindful the woman reading this the wife reading this is mindful of her role and responsibility to do just that good and not evil and not because he deserves it and not because he has done from the wife's perspective not because he has done good to her but because before God she's required to do good to him verse 30 favor is deceitful beauty is vain but a woman that feareth the Lord she shall be praised a woman that feareth the Lord a woman should think in terms of honoring God honoring God revering God and yes um, there are times when uh, in Christian marriages a, uh, there could be perhaps a tendency to think well <clears throat> I'll honor God I I I, I can't see really how I'm, 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 I'm to be distracted honoring my husband I'm really all about I, I really love the Lord so much I'm going to honor God well you're not honoring God if you're not honoring your husband if you're not showing him respect if you're not loving him if you're not being to him who God has called and ordained you to be to him 
And you're not under God. It's, it's, it's like it says over there in First John. How do we love God whom we've not seen if we don't love our neighbor who we have seen? Can we really say that we're honoring God, fearing God, worshiping God, reverencing God? If we're not showing to our husbands the kind of reverence, respect, love, attention, care, help that God has called us to? And as God has called godly wives to? Favor is deceitful, beauty vain, but a woman that feareth the Lord, she shall be praised. Now, I'm going to take you from here, because we take a few minutes, and let's say we're going to move through the subject rather quickly. We take a few minutes, and we talk about the, the, how wonderful marriage is, and how good and, and godly it is. I'm going to ask you to go with me over to 1 Corinthians chapter 7. There's no bad news over here, but this is another way of looking at marriage, isn't there here? So important for married couples to remember this. Look with me down to verse 33 of 1 Corinthians 7, and I'm reading from the New King James. But he who is married cares about the things of the world, how he may please his wife. There's a difference between a wife and a virgin. The unmarried woman cares about the things of the Lord that she may be holy both in body and in spirit, but she who is married cares about the things of the world, how she may please her husband. And this I say for your profit, not to put a leash on you, but for what is proper, that you may serve the Lord without distraction. Well, <clears throat> every married couple, or soon to be married couple, should remember this. Amen? It's not all about the marriage, is it? Is it? No. No. While in a marriage relationship, husbands and wives have responsibilities to each other, and plenty of those responsibilities take on a rather natural form, don't they? Yep. You know, we, we think of... Um, <clears throat> uh, Things we, we think of the, the husband's responsibility to take care of and, and, and please his wife. You know, it wouldn't be a, a you know, just there, there have been a number, number of examples here recently where I've talked with guys and they're mindful of, well, what would the wife like to do? What would she prefer? And that's good. That's, that's right that he should be thinking along those lines. Amen. But at some point, there can be a conflict between uh, what, you know, you got this guy who wants to please his wife. He's not going to violate any plain biblical principles in doing so. No, the, expect, the, 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 the preferences that she might have are not unreasonable. But sometimes they just don't fit the plan of God. And sometimes a husband is having to make hard decisions because, yeah, he'd like to do what he, his wife would like to do, but he's got to take into consideration a higher and holier cause. And that's part of being a godly husband and a godly wife, isn't it? Where both parties would understand that. The decisions are made First and foremost, for the advancement of the kingdom. We just read here that God's the one that says, he who is married cares about the things of the world, how he may please his wife. And that's not sin. No, that's part of the responsibility. That's not all caught up in doing everything to please her and she's got to do everything to please him. No, no, not saying that. But there's a place for husbands to consider what their wives would prefer and wives to consider what their husbands would prefer. And they attend to each other in that way. They minister to each other in that way. But there are other times when, yep, you know, I know that you'd prefer this, but all things considered, I believe that the Lord has something else for us. And the husband makes that kind of a decision. Let's look over to Ephesians. Shift gears from Listen, for, that's enough for 1 Corinthians chapter 7. I would not put a leash on you. 
serve the Lord without distraction. Amen? Amen. <clears throat> Plenty of ground to cover here, and my goodness sakes. I, I'm gonna, we're going to start Ephesians 4. We, we, we'll try to get down to, to chapter 5, but I brought along this passage of Scripture from the NIV, and I want to begin reading from verse 25. Therefore, each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to his neighbor, for we are all members of one body. These instructions through this passage, this portion of this epistle, lauded details about how the body is to relate to one another. The members of the body, how they're to minister to one another, get along with one another. You know, chapter 5 will speak specifically to husband-wife relationships. And yes, we'll likely get there in a bit. But husbands and wives are members of the body of Christ first, aren't they? And so we deal with some matters, some of the, some of the instruction that's given by the apostle and how brothers and sisters are to get along. Because that's what husbands and wives in Christ are to one another. Therefore, each of you must put off falsehood, speak truthfully to his neighbor, for you are members of one body. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry. There's some good instruction for a married couple. Amen? Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry. And do not give the devil a foothold. Those are coupled, aren't they? Don't want to give any place to the devil in a marriage relationship by giving place to uh, resentment, any kind of uh, bitterness, strife, anger. No. We'll drop, we'll, we'll skip over 28, but we'll drop down and pick it up at verse 29. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. How about a husband and a wife just purposing before the Lord that they would not let any unwholesome talk come out of their mouths, but only what is helpful for building up their spouse according to their needs, they may, that they may benefit those who, who listen. There's a whole lot of destruction. There's a whole lot of damage that can be done with, with words, and you can't get them back. You can say, I'm sorry. You can come and ask for forgiveness, but you can't take them back. It's... Again, over the years, I've had occasion to talk with different ones about allowing, uh, the, the, in the, the frustration, uh, allowing rash things to come out of their mouths. Extreme things. Like, I, you know, I hate you. I wish I'd never married you. or Things like that. Those thoughts should never be entertained by... Christians who are married. And never should we allow out of our mouths those kinds of words. Can God forgive you if you say things like that? Yeah. Can a spouse forgive you? Yeah. But you know, you still do damage. You, you've exercised yourself in giving place to uh, anger, frustration, And you've given occasion to the enemy to sow seeds of doubt and concern in the, in the heart and mind of your spouse regarding the, the depth and the seriousness of the commitment. And it did, does my spouse, my husband, my wife really, really mean that? Or do they have to struggle with that? Or do they think that they made a mistake? Do they really not love me? Do they really not love me like they once did? You got to contend with those things if they're allowed out of the mouth. That it's just like like leaven, isn't it? Like a seed that's sown in there. Don't allow it out of your mouth. No unwholesome talk, but only what is helpful 
for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. You know, sometimes we, we lightly talk. You know, there's, a ten, there's tension in a marriage relation. There's some, you know, back and forth a little bit. At some point, somebody ought to say, you know, somebody ought to be able to, well, both of them ought to be able to pull up and say, hey, this is not, this is not pleasing to the Lord. It's not going the way it should be going. And they bring it to an end and get it back on the right course. But maybe it doesn't, uh, doesn't occur to both that that's what, maybe aren't, both aren't ready to do so. But maybe one could say, hey, no, this is not good. And what the, the, the frustration that I hear coming out of my spouse, I want to be used to the Lord to help there. Not just throw fuel on the fire. Because married couples uh, pretty quickly learn how to push buttons, don't they? They learn what kinds of things uh, can be used very effectively to keep the, keep the fires of anger and, and, uh, and bitterness burning brightly. The Bible says that a soft answer turns away wrath, doesn't it? It really does take two. And if one will say, within and outwardly, no, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna allow myself to, to give place to unwholesome talk, but rather I'm gonna look to the Lord right now for his grace to minister grace, to help here, to see this tension dissipated and the peace of God restored. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you are sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness and rage and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. That's always the standard, isn't it? How has is, how is the Lord loved me? How has he dealt with me? How, is he, how is, uh, is he toward me? Is he uh, bitter? Is he uh, malicious? Is he unkind? Is he harsh? Is he impatient? Which to love as we have been loved by the Lord. Seeking the building up, the edification, the well-being of another. Always. Amen? Amen. Amen? Well, let's move on to... Chapter 5, <clears throat> where we'll pick it up. And now I'm switching translations as we ch switch chapters. Going to the New King James again. The latter part of verse 18 says, be filled with the Spirit. That's, a, that's an essential. Without him, we can do nothing. We can't have good godly marriages. We can't conduct good God-honoring, close, intimate relationships without the Spirit of God. One thing that <clears throat> uh, an honest married individual will quickly come to recognize if they haven't come to grips with it already, uh, that they are much more selfish than they ever thought they were. We talk of a spouse bringing out the best in the other, right? Yeah. It doesn't always go that way, does it? It's a, it is amazing. Again, back to the, the carnal perspective. People, Christian people, point fingers and say, it's their fault. They made me, yeah, act carnally. They, act, they made me, it was them, they provoked me, they, if it wasn't for them, I, no, they're just God's anointed vessel. <laughs> Being used of the Lord to show you what's really in you. 
Bible says it's what's in abundance of the heart is what comes out. Amen? Mm -hmm. So it wasn't them that made you do it. No, it was in there and just under, just took a little bit of pressure. Just, again, somebody pushing the button and here you are. Losing your temper, insisting on your way, your rightness. You're just and they're wrong, they're unfair, they're unkind. And we forget who God has called and ordained us to be. Be filled with the Spirit. Sometimes married couples in their, in their, uh, their, just their enthusiasm, their love and commitment to one another, they get a, a little negligent in their relationship with the Lord. They're not as fervent in pursuing God. If you love that spouse, you will stay very, very devoted to the Lord all the days of your life. You'll maintain your personal devotion with the Lord because you want to draw on the Spirit of God to be to your spouse who God would have you to be. You want to love them in a godly way. How can you love them in a godly way without God? Be filled with the Spirit speaking to, no, to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. There's a couple of lovebirds for you, huh? <laughs> Singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things to God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And then he goes on submitting to one another in the fear of God. Commonly when we talk from Ephesians 5, we pick it up in verse 22. We don't want to forget verse 21. The inspired writer says, submitting to one another in the fear of God. It's the word of God that's the standard. God's holiness. God's love. God's selflessness. Amen? It's often said that uh, one of the, the, the good godly ways of being assured of a healthy marriage, Christian marriage, is just look to outdo the other in serving and being kind. That's an admirable goal, isn't it? Just outdo that other one, your spouse, in serving them and being kind. Submitting one to another in the fear of God speaks of an acknowledgement that God's word, God's wisdom is the standard. If at any given time, one party, you know, he goes on and he talks obviously about wives and their, their role of submitting to their husbands. But we know that that does not mean that a wife is to submit to her husband if the standard, if the expectation is not a biblical one. A good godly wife will from time to time find herself in a position where she is having to remind her husband what the Bible has to say on the particular subject. And a good godly husband will humbly acknowledge that to be the case. You say, that's right. That's the wisdom of God. That's what we're going to do. Because I said so. <laughs> I mean, I mean. <laughs> Submitting to one another in the fear of God. Amen? Where the words are the standard. God's holiness is, is the, <clears throat> the objective. His honor for his holiness and his holiness in our lives. Submitting one to another in the fear of God. Wives, <clears throat> submit to your own husbands. You know, we've, we've uh, just briefly, look with me, on the subject of, of submission. Uh, he says, <clears throat> verse 22, wives submit. Uh, verse 23, the husband is the head. Uh, verse 24, uh, the wives are to be subject to their husbands in everything. <clears throat> and uh, you drop all the way down to verse 33, latter part of the verse, let the wife see that she respects her husband. And then you'd see <clears throat> in uh, verses 25, the husband is to love the wife. Verse 28, husbands are to love their wives. In this passage of scripture, that is the order. You'd find that the husbands are instructed to love and the wives are instructed to have a reverence and a respect and to be in submission to. 
Obviously, that doesn't mean that the, the, you could go over to the, the Titus passage, the Titus 2 passage. And there, yes, wives are to love their husbands, whether the old ones are to teach the young ones to love their husbands, so that we could conclude that they are to love their husbands. Amen? Amen? <laughs> so it's not just uh, husbands love, wives respect. <clears throat> of course, uh, the flip side of that is that Husbands are to respect and honor their wives, giving honor unto them as the weaker vessel. Amen? Amen. But here he starts out teaching that wives are to be in submission to their own husbands as to the Lord. I mentioned a moment ago that there may be times when a husband, and we've run into this plenty over the years, where a husband uh, expects, wants to expect his wife to submit, but the course that he is, is uh, putting before the wife of the family is not a biblical one. It's not, not uh, borne out in the scripture, not substantiated by the scripture. A wife does not have a responsibility before God to submit to that headship, that wrong direction. That can be a difficult one to walk on out because the wife has the responsibility to respectfully not submit when there is wrong or unbiblical direction. It's not an opportunity just to say, well, you don't know what you're talking about or I don't have to show you any respect because what you're telling me is not biblical. No, when you've got two people that are committed to Jesus and the head might be saying something that is unbiblical, well, you got to work that out. Amen? Wife is not under an obligation to go along and do things that are unbiblical, but she does have to continue to show her respect to her husband as unto the Lord as unto the Lord. The husband is the head of the wife, and that is an order that, that we well understand. We don't need to emphasize that. Uh, it's, we're, not the, uh, uh, we're not a group of people where I, I, I believe that to be a, a question in anybody's mind here this evening. Um, uh, we know that in terms of value, men and women are equally valued before the Lord. <clears throat> this order that God has established for the marriage relationship and for the church has nothing to do with value. It's order. That's what it is. Women are every bit as precious to God as men are. Just because uh, God says the husband is the head of the wife doesn't mean that the husbands are all smarter than women are. We, Lord knows we know that's not the case. <laughs> It's just order that God has established for the church and for the home, for the marriage relationship. Somebody's got to be in charge. And God says it's the husbands that are the heads. Uh, of course, we live in a society, in, in a world, and we should, anybody should guard against the, the vexation. It's just so blatant. It's, it's readily identifiable, the, uh, the, the things that are so out of order. You know, long ago, they, they started making the, the commercials where the, the woman is the, the smart one, the savvy one, and the guy's just some goofball doofus. All he wants to do is sit around on the couch and watch TV. And the woman is the bright and intelligent one that's holding everything together in a very composed way. And she's got her career, and she's, she's um, uh, bright and smart, and she's just dealing with this uh, couch potato guy. And, and then, of course, you get all the... How about the commercials? I watch television once in a while. And the commercials that now come on in. And, you know, the guy's got the baby on his hip. And he's throwing the load into the, the washing machine. And <laughs> what a, the, everything in our culture, you know, tries to uh, reverse roles. The Bible says plainly over in Titus that women are to be keepers at home. Amen? I'm getting a little bit of a head. We'll... we'll, uh, we'll uh, I only mention those as examples uh, because we live in a world where, uh, yep, we're, sub, we're, we're exposed to wisdoms and philosophies that are inconsistent with what the Bible has to say regarding roles and responsibilities. God's the one that said the husband is the head of the wife as Christ also is the head of the church, the savior of the body. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. 
He says, verse 25, Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word, that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. A husband's responsibility as he stands before the Lord is to bring ministry to his wife so that she becomes more like Jesus. That's what a husband's goal is, to make her more like Jesus. Because uh, above that woman being wife to me, the husband, she's a child of God being prepared for Jesus' soon return. Amen? So the husband, is, his objective is to see her grow as a Christian. If she's a good Christian, she'll be a good wife. She'll be ready when Jesus comes back. Amen? The objective that the husband has is not just to get her to do everything his way, the way he likes it, the way he wants it done, when he wants it done. No, no. Just make her more like Jesus. That she grows in a relationship with the Lord. That she learns how to apply the truths of the word to her sphere of responsibility. Sometimes a husband has to tell his wife how he would have her love him. Yeah. Sometimes husbands have to say, you know, and it might seem, this might seem a little bit uh, self-serving, but this is really uh, the way I expect you to do things because that's the way I want our home run. You know, with regard to having things this way or that way. You know, say a, say a wife is... Um, maybe isn't the, the, the most orderly or organized, and the, the husband wants things to be better organized and more orderly in his home. Maybe he's thinking also of the training of the children. You know, I want the kids to learn to be a little bit more orderly and organized, punctual, whatever it might be. And so a husband says, listen, this is the way it's going to be. We're going to do things on this schedule or this way. And that's just requiring not just for his personal preference, but because he believes that that's consistent with the... Uh, will and plan of God for their home. And so husbands bring that kind of, of care and attention. Ministry from the word, it's not just, it's not just uh, uh, quoting verses to her, helping her uh, learn what the Bible has to say on a particular doctrine. Nope, it's encouraging her with the word of God in areas where she might be struggling. I mean, Lord knows any, any wife needs a lot of help just in dealing with their husband. <laughs> Somebody, right? <laughs> now all the guys, that was, that was a guy amen, should have been, should have been a guy. Guys know that as they, as they think about their wives, I mean, their wives really need help from God and husbands really know that they really need help from God to be godly husbands. But they also know that phew, um, my wife really needs an abundant supply of grace because of who she's married to. Amen? Amen. Yeah. And so you, you, you pray for your wife and you pray that you know the grace of God and the power of God to be to them as as, as Christ is to them. That's the way we're to love our lives, as Christ loves the church. That's the standard. Nothing less should ever be considered acceptable. Nothing less, guys, should ever be considered acceptable. Loving your wife as Christ loves the church. Gave himself for her. He does so to present her or us to himself a glorious church without spot or wrinkle or any such thing that she, that is we, would be holy and without blemish. So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. That's sowing and reaping. That's what's being talked of there. You understand that, don't you? See, if you really love your wife in a godly way, the objective is helping her become more Christ-like. 
Can you think of anybody that is going to more immediately benefit than you? She's more Christ-like. You're the first beneficiary of her Christ-likeness. Amen? Amen? You're first in line to benefit. And she's more like Jesus. So that's your objective. Help her to be more Christ-like. That's like loving yourself. He that loves his wife, loves himself. You're going you're gonna to do well. You make your... What, you help your wife to become all that God has called her to be, ordained her to be. You assist her in that, and you benefit. No one ever yet hated his wife, nourishes and cherishes it, even as the Lord does the church. We are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this reason, a man shall leave father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. So this really applies to all of us. Every one of us are members of this body. We're endeavoring to edify one another in anticipation of Jesus' imminent return. Nevertheless, let each one of you in particular so love his wife as himself and let the wife see that she respects her husband. With regards to respect, reverence, honor. You know, I jokingly said, yeah, we all know that obviously uh, the, the guys aren't heads just because they're smarter than their wives. Um, don't ever... Uh, <clears throat> wives should never uh, do anything to... Uh, cause their husbands to have to really come to grips with that reality. <laughs> you know, it's sort of that unspoken uh, understanding, you know, you know what I'm saying there? Sometimes it's, just, it's known and understood, but we don't have to say so. Show a little respect is what I'm saying. Sometimes guys do dumb things. But the Wife doesn't have to say, I was dumb. <laughs> God, will, God will come to that conclusion sooner or later, hopefully. But uh, a wife, a good godly wife, doesn't feel compelled to point it out to her husband. She has a little bit more respect for him than that and uh, doesn't need to, you know, uh, make too much of it. Uh, Guys got some guys got some pretty big egos, and um, and a, a big big part of a, of the role that a wife uh, does play is uh, being there to support and, and, and encourage, and to 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 let him know that that to him she's the to to her he's the greatest, and so a, a wife should be. Uh, building her husband up like that with words of encouragement. Uh, that's the kind of respect that, that guys need. That they, that they really know that to, at least to their wife, there's somebody special. Because to the rest of the world, you know, they may or may not be. But at least they can find in their wife somebody who really recognizes their true greatness. <laughs> A wife is to respect her husband. Respect him as the head that God has given to her and have a regard for him hearing from God on the behalf of the household and family because that's the way a God, that, that God uses a godly husband. God speaks through that husband and leads and provides for that family through the good godly husband. And so the wife should respect their husband for who he is, but more so because of the, uh, even more so because of who he is in the plan of God and the role that he is, is seeking to fulfill as he seeks to honor God as a godly husband, godly head of the household, godly dad, 
member of the, the body of Christ. Husbands should be respected by their wives, not criticized by. It's a it's an awful thing that uh, women would talk about their husbands to their girlfriends. Just, you know, talk about the stupid things that he did or the, the I mean, uh, how that how it, it escapes the woman, you know, that um, that she's talking about the stupid. Uh, well, I put it this way. What kind of individual does it take to marry somebody stupid? <laughs> Point made, right? <laughs> so women should, women should respect their husbands. And, and husbands should love their wives as Christ loved the church. Always looking to, to see that, that godly, and it's a gift from God. A gift from God, uh, one, <clears throat> one through whom God favors the husband. And the husband should be very grateful, very thankful, not complain about uh, her, uh, her, her faults, her lack, or, or the things that she doesn't do the way he would like them to do, never growing impatient. No, nope, just loving and looking to see her conformed to the image of Jesus. If there are some things, of course there are things that aren't perfect. But God intends that husbands and wives would be used by him to work on those things and to grow more Christ-like. And when things are working the way they should, that, that really happens. When husbands and wives are fulfilling their God-ordained roles, they are indeed being used of the Lord to help each other be more godly. More Christ-like, more selfless, less selfish. He says, I speak concerning Christ in the church. This is what the Lord is always doing. He's always doing this work in, in us, isn't he? Yeah, because he washes us with his, the water of his word. Let, let husbands and wives endeavor to draw on the grace of God. And there is abundant grace to be good godly husbands and godly wives. If God has ordained it, then there's help from above to pull it off. Amen? Amen. We'll finish there for this evening. Heavenly Father, we do thank you and praise you. We thank you for the gift of marriage, that union. It is a, a type, a pattern of our union with you through Jesus Christ, in him. Help us to always bear that in mind. Sometimes we do get selfish. Our emotions are very much a part of a, a healthy marriage relationship. But sometimes they become... Too important. They, our emotion becomes too dominant and we get off course. Our feelings get hurt. Our preferences aren't, aren't met. We look to you for help, O oh Lord God. That in all our relationships with one another, certainly in marriage relationships and family and homes, but in the body of Christ that we would prefer others better than ourselves. And all we seek to edify and Lord ever help us to speak that which is good to the use of edifying. No corrupt communication, no unwholesome word. Help us, O oh Father God, that you'd be honored and glorified. We thank you for it, Father God. In Jesus' name, let's stand together and minister to the Lord in song as we finish up this evening. Hallelujah.
We do. Bless and praise your holy name, O oh Lord God. Lord Jesus. Jehovah is salvation. Thank you, O oh Lord God. Thank you, Father, for your presence in our lives. Now bless these, your people, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Be sure and greet one another in the love of the Lord Jesus. God's grace and peace go with you all.